These are multi-millionaires, and this is where they grew up. You get zero motivation to do anything. And they put me in the same cell as the guy that at the World Trade Center the first time. So today, I'm going to be asking them what their secret was to escape such a dead-end environment, and what they do to make millions if they were stuck back in the trenches. If I wanted to make a million dollars and I was back to zero, I would 100%. Baltimore consists of several different economic regions. The West region specifically consists of hood, crime, and poverty, exactly where the stomping grounds of 22-year-old real estate millionaire Omar Rashid are. My name is Omar Rashid. I'm a 22-year-old real estate agent, and I also run a real estate marketing agency. My real estate sales business is around $400,000 a year, and my marketing agency does about $700,000 a year. It wasn't always like this. At 16, I moved here from a third world country, Ethiopia. I had absolutely nothing. I moved to Baltimore City with my dad to a one-bedroom apartment, and if you guys know Baltimore, it's not the nicest place place in the world. Ranking as one of the poorest and most dangerous cities in America, Baltimore seems to offer nothing more than resulting to crime to get by. So Omar and I would take a trip down to the area he grew up in to see the environments he was surrounded by, which he would eventually break out of to make his first million. Kind of put simply, what are you doing to make money to be able to get out of this and have that car? I'm selling. I sell real estate. That's what I do. So I help people buy and sell real estate. So if someone wants to sell their house, they can come to me and be like, Omar, I want to sell my house. And pretty much I go through the process of marketing their property, putting it online, taking photos, making it look good, and trying to sell it for the highest possible price. And real estate seems like you need a lot of money to get into, but is that true? You need money to get into real estate when you're investing in real estate. I have nothing to do with their real estate transactions. I'm just coming in like, hey, Ryan, I see you're trying to sell your house. Let me sell it for you. Give me two and a half percent to three percent for it, for my efforts, for my job. Easy. Selling real estate was a low barrier to entry enough that Omar could start bringing in some cash despite living in poverty. But before he showed me how he managed to grow his business to make millions a year, I wanted to know what made him take this path versus everyone else he was surrounded by. Here, what's the usual way people are making money out here? It's all how much percentage of people out here do you think have sold drugs or have done something illegal to make money out here? I mean, I don't know a specific number, but again, it's just the surroundings. Like when you're surrounded by that, that's all you know, it's all you see. When you, all you see, the fancy cars being driven by like the guys that do sell drugs, and that influences a huge population of the, especially the young people here. You are your environment, right? right? So it's a lot easier for you to go that path than the other path, which is why I'm like a huge believer in like, change your environment, 90% chance you will end up like your environment. Right, I mean, just like, even just looking at like yeah. these houses, dude. You get zero motivation to do anything. And also, if you don't see it, you don't believe it. If this is the norm, if this is the standard, this is all you know. Were you ever at a point where you thought that you were gonna go down this path? Like when you move from Ethiopia, then you start seeing yeah. this around you. It's yeah. probably better than Ethiopia 100%. still, but it's, I mean, it's probably easy to think yeah. You know, maybe I'll, oh, I'll, I'll go start selling or... Honestly, no. Thank God, because I, I had a mission. I had a goal in my head. I'm like, hey, like, I got to bring my family to a position where we can do what we want, live in a life that we're proud of, happy with. Putting his own goals above his surroundings is one of the key factors which would lead to Omar's success. And after meeting up with his friend Justin, who makes money in a very similar way, he'd show us a house on the same block that he is actually trying to get sold. So while most people would look at these houses and think, never would touch, yeah. you see it as an opportunity, make a flip. Yeah, when I see the stress, I see money, so. You always want to make some noise when you're walking in there, make sure there's no squatter in there. A lot of times, there's squatters in these houses. What's the squatter? Somebody living in a house that they don't own, like a, maybe a homeless oh. person. They break in the houses, they just stand there. Have you dealt with one in one of your houses? Yeah, he was friendly though. I, I dealt with a couple of them. Luckily, I get friendly ones. Like, they just, one of them was like sad, but I had to leave. I went in the basement. I found a whole bunch of blood on the floor. He said his brother was missing. I'm like, it wasn't a surprise the house Justin was trying to get sold was not in the best condition. He'll have to try really hard to market it perfectly to get as much traffic through that front door as possible so he can eventually find a buyer. All just goes to show you have to start somewhere, and sometimes that's exactly where you grew up. After this, we'd head over to one of Omar and Justin's friends, Tone, who's also made a killing off of real estate. As you can see, a lot of people people who are trying to make it out legally have fallen into the world of real estate, but what Tone would say next about it was pretty shocking. How are the majority of people making money out here in, in the hoods of Baltimore? Everybody making something out of nothing. My man got the 
clothing line, natural born hustlers. You know, got my man Justin wholesale in the houses. They was trying to make it illegal last year. I felt some kind of way about that. You remember they was trying to make wholesale in the league? I felt some kind of way about it. Why is it why? Because the majority of us doing it or us. Right. Recently, the Maryland state legislator has been trying to pass a bill which would severely limit wholesaling, which is just another word for the act of helping sell real estates like Tone, Omar, and Justin are doing. One of the ways is requiring licenses and making it much harder to do, ultimately gatekeeping new entrepreneurs trying to get on their feet like we see here in Baltimore. So do you think it's harder to, to find a hustle and to sort of get on a path like this compared to someone like, I guess, me, who's like just the suburban white kid. I don't know. I feel like we got a little bit of an advantage because the fire a little different up under When you have to make it work, when you have no option but to make it work, that gives us a little bit of an advantage. Like, this is where we come from. That's like, we're, we're already at the bottom. It's only up. From working on houses in the worst parts of the city and building their way up to million dollar properties like Omar has right here, it's clear these guys know something that countless other people across the world don't. So when Omar took us on a tour through his studio, I decided to ask him one simple question. If you were in the hood again and you wanted to make a million dollars, what would you do? <laughs> I... 80 million dollars. That is how much Dayton Mills game development company Branch is valued at. But only 10 years ago, he was dirt poor in a very different type of hood, but he found one thing that soon changes life forever. I'm Dayton Mills. I'm the founder of Branch, a game dev company. I'm from the Ozarks. More than 16% of the population live under the poverty line. And were you part of that? Oh yeah. yeah, I was a part of that. As a family, like we've been evicted probably more than a dozen times. Dayton had one of the nicest offices I had ever seen, and before I asked him exactly how we'd go from trailer park hoods to building an eight-figure business, he went and gave me a tour. Yeah, let me give you the tour. One of these goes faster than the other one. Don't give it full throttle. Holy, $80 million company. <laughs> this is where people work. Where, where is everyone at right now? Uh, it's Saturday. Why, why is there so many phones on the table right here? <laughs> there are close to 20,000 different devices that you have to test for when you're building a mobile game. What is Branch? What are you testing on these phones? We're building a game called Castaways, which is like in, it's heavily inspired by Minecraft Skyblock. And so it's a cross-platform MMO. So how do you raise $15 million to build a game? Well, gaming has definitely changed a lot since 2009. You have games that gross more than the top grossing movies. Tapping into this market has allowed Dayton to fall out his dreams of making money in the gaming industry and get the office most entrepreneurs dream of, which was an extreme contrast to one of the places he grew up. That's my house. Yeah, it looks like they put a new roof on it. Would you ever go back or? No, I wouldn't. I mean, what was the first step? What was the way you're able to make it out from this to begin with? After we had left that house, we moved into these apartments. Apartments. I was probably like 12 at this time, and I'm running around with some friends I had. But one of those friends, his name was Kyle, because of course it was, showed me Minecraft. I thought it was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. And I had begged my parents for like a year or something after that for a computer. For my birthday, they gave me this like $300 HP computer and it was from there that I started doing everything. Like, I wanted to learn Java so that I could make mods. I wanted to make money with it so then I learned how to make servers and then I learned how to monetize those servers. I just started doing like all these different creative things. After familiarizing himself in the space more and more, Dayton was able to build himself up just from an old computer and move out of his problematic living circumstances. And now that we know what got him here and where he is now, I wondered how exactly exactly he managed to do it. This is quite something. Don't think I've ever seen a $80 million company with go-karts driving around. If you were to start back where you were in that trailer park, in that house you were showing us, and you wanted to make $1 million, what would be your first step? What would you do? I'd learn a skill. How would you go about scaling it to the point where it's worth eight figures? You need distribution. Building a product's not enough. You create something of value when you do something at a large scale. I could clean houses in my neighborhood, but there's only 10 houses on my block. But if I could make an app where you can 
get your house cleaned anywhere in the country, now you've got millions of houses that could be cleaned, right? So it can't just be the skill, it also has to be the marketing, distribution, the business side of things. Skill and scale. While every successful person I've talked to throughout this video always made money through legal means to get on their feet, Sean V. Bradley was the complete opposite. Selling on the streets, in prison three times, to now having over $55 million in personal income, mainly from his automotive sales training and consulting company, Dealer Synergy. So I needed to know, how did he come back from all of that? We actually had the building painted orange. The whole brand is the orange tie guy for the last 19 out of 20 years I've owned the company. It's been orange, orange, orange. So I have a, a brand new 2023 uh, Maserati Levante F Tributo, which is a limited edition. There's only 200 in the world. I got married in an orange castle. What is orange just your favorite color or something? Or? No, it's not just favorite color. I read a book uh, from Seth Godin, who's the godfather of marketing, called The Purple Cow. So the purple cow is in a thousand acre field, you don't want to be a black and white cow if you want to get picked. You want to, you want to stand out, you want to be the purple cow. When I first started my company, I was thinking, okay, what could my purple cow moment be? So I thought about, okay, I need to pick company colors. So I picked black and orange because wherever I go, one of the biggest questions I get is, why the orange tire, why the orange? And my response is always, that's why because you're asking me. Wanna give us a little rundown. So what is your company? What is Dealer Synergy, which made you a multimillionaire at this point? So Dealer Synergy is technically an international training, consulting, and accountability firm. What does that mean? Well, first and foremost, I work with big car dealerships. One of my clients, for example, is the Coons Automotive Group. These multi-million or multi-billion dollar are publicly traded dealerships or dealer groups. They hire my company to do sales training so we'll train car salesmen car saleswomen on everything from prospecting lead generation time maximization everything to do human development so how did you figure out you wanted to help people better their sales versus just going and selling yourself okay so i started selling cars um back in 1999 so about 25 years ago i was really good at it i used to average about 33 units a month which is tr more than triple what national average was and i thought to myself all i'm doing is making this guy more rich. Why should I not do it for myself? Just talking to him, I could tell Sean was an incredible salesman, but after asking how he developed these skills in the first place, which he'd used to build an eight-figure business, I was completely taken back by the answer. I grew up very unconventional. I grew up in, in Queens, New York, in Brooklyn, New York, in the jungle, man, in, in the belly of the beast. And there's a lot of crazy stuff, gang activity, street activity, stuff like that. So I was uh, involved in a lot of uh, extra curricular stuff as a child. Yeah, so I started hustling on the streets of New York at six, seven years old, legitimately. And then from there, it graduated to crazier and crazier things uh, until I got caught up in, in some massive federal stuff by the Secret Service and DEA as a teenager. I'm on the largest case in the United States history for nightclubs and ecstasy, the Limelight Tunnel case in 1996. I mean, what was the reason you got into all of the, the street hustle? Was it just the culture around you? It Was yeah, everyone else no, doing no, that? Or? No, no, necessity, man. I was poor, you know. Again, if you either are going to be the sheep or you're going to be the wolf you know what i mean like if 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 i wanted sneakers or toys literally toys or anything my family didn't have anything I, my mom was a single mom poor and we were tortured by our stepfather it was really violent really abusive really crazy and my my biological father was never there so I'm not making excuses but the, the question was why did i get into it well because i didn't want to be hungry and i didn't want to have ghetto ass clothes and and bobos and shit like that and so if, if i wasn't going to get that from a, a parental thing i had to figure out ways as a child and how to get things. Becoming a gang member, selling inside of nightclubs, getting caught and going to federal prison for three years, and of course. And they put me in the same cell as the guy that the World Trade Center the first time. What suddenly changed him and led him down the path to making millions of dollars legally? See, the problem is that when I was hustling on the street, I never thought I was touchable on the street until, you know, I, I all the stuff came crashing down. But when I came home and I started hustling again, I just, I had this weird feeling. I was like, man, I'm gonna get knocked. I'm gonna go back to prison. So I decided that I needed to just change. I became a waiter at the Broadway Diner on Broad Street in Red Bank. And I sucked at being a waiter. So I got fired from like three or four different places. And then my friend Billy, the co-star from the Vice TV show says, you should sell cars. Now, ex-gang member, ex-convict, piece of shit. I was like, I don't wanna sell cars. Those are like, those are car salesmen, ill. 
hilarious because the automotive industry is what changed my life. From there, Sean fell in love with the automotive industry, quit his job to pursue his own business where he now consults for billion dollar car dealerships. So what was his secret to all of this? Well, speaking with him from here on out would honestly be the most valuable interview I think I've ever done. And for people who are in a similar position or just struggling to just get money, get their own business, what's some advice you would give them? People, places, and things. And I, this they talk about in the Vice TV show that I did. If you want to change your life, change the people you surround yourself with, change the places that you go and hang out, and change the things that you do. If you want a shot at, at, at really breaking free and doing something with your life, you have to cut the chains that bind you. I know you're a busy man. One last question. So you've sold cars, illegal substances. How do you sell the pen? I, here's what I don't. If anybody thinks that you're gonna be successful about how to sell a pen, I think that they're silly, you know what I mean? So again, that's like saying, hey, what would you do if you were a platypus? I'm not a platypus, so I'm not gonna go around and sell a pen, so I'm not gonna waste my time or audience time about <laughs> the pen stuff. What would you do starting all the way from scratch? Sales, sales in general. I don't care what you're selling. I don't care if you're selling software, I don't care if you're selling cars, shoes, houses. Obviously, the higher the price of what you can sell, the more money you'll make. But if you just get into sales, and get into commission-based jobs, you will absolutely make money. You have to be a little bit crazy, not too much, but just a little bit crazy to where you believe, I am gonna make this happen no matter what, you will.